So I often talk about language issues in physics and how um, a guy's lack of proper language use can lead to them uh, dropping down a grade in the physics exam. So this is to explain the issue a bit more. And what I mean really is three things by language use in physics. One, that you're using the correct scientific phrases. Two, that you're putting these phrases in the correct context and also the, the correct grammar, but I won't get into that. And three, understanding what the question is saying exactly and answering the question entirely. So let's start with the first one. So the first one is scientific phrases. And I suppose I'll start with where do you get the phrases? And it's very straightforward. You get them from the syllabus. So what you need to do is download the syllabus and actually print the thing off. So if we look at something like this, um, you automatically have two scientific phrases on this syllabus. And that's up at the top, charge resides on the outside of a metallic conductor and charge accumulates at a point. These are two phrases that you need to be able to memorize and learn. Now, what I would suggest is to go through the syllabus and identify or underline all these phrases and memorize them straight off. Right, so I'm going to go through a few more. So you've got sound intensity level there. And the black text, it says doubling the sound intensity increases the sound intensity level by three decibels. That's something you have to memorize. Um, and very often, if this comes up, you'll get a question, uh, what is the effect of doubling the sound intensity? And you just state that, that sentence exactly for full works. The other one there on that is just below the black text. The decibel adapted scale is used because it's adapted for the air's fre uh, frequency response. And again, that's a sentence you just learn off. So like I said, go away, underline these in the syllabus, and just memorize these phrases immediately. Now I got some more. So under the concept of temperature and thermometric property, Specifically, thermometric property, there's the definition, a physical property that changes measurably with, with temperature. And also the concept of temperature is the measure of hotness and coldness of a body. They're just definitions. And here are some more. So some of my favourite ones, uh, a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field experiences a force. That's what the first sentence says. Said It even gives you the formula and the factors that it depends on. <clears throat> um, and there's a few other things. And then the last one. Uh, one that comes up not so frequently, but you do need to know, is in x-rays there, x-ray production is the inverse of the photoelectric effect. And very often these are things that you don't need to understand, you just have to repeat. But you should understand them, that's the, the idea with it. Now before I move on to the next part, if you are downloading the, well you should download the syllabus and underline, underlining these phrases, I would also identify the formula that the syllabus is asking you to uh, to pick out. Most of those are in the log tables. You should know where those are. So that's the second job I'd expect you to do. And the third job is when you have that syllabus in front of you, use my red light, yellow light, green light method, or RYG, to identify what exactly you need to study immediately, what's a bit rusty, so maybe the yellows, and what's good to go, as in you don't need to study it anymore. And <clears throat> if you identify all the reds and a uh, and get those sorted immediately, then move on to the yellows, you'll find yourself increasing and improving very quickly. You'll also find that you'll spend less time studying physics because you'll have more and more greens. And then it'll be just um, a case of maintenance with your study rather than covering new things. Okay, how to memorize these phrases. So this is very straightforward. You read, you restate the phrase in your head, and then you write it down. Now, the reading, you might have to read it three or four times. The restating, you might want to restate five, six, seven, ten times. Um, that stage actually is very quick, so you can restate it in your head many, many times. If you are a visual person, you may actually visualise the definition in your head and you may be able to read it from the visualisation of that definition. Some people are like that. But it's really important to write it down because the exam is a written exam and you need to prepare yourself for the written aspect of the exam. In other words, you need to write stuff down. So doing it in your head and not writing it down is not a complete system. You need to prepare for what you're going to be examined in, and you're going to be examined in a written exam. Okay, after you write it down, you need to correct it, and then there are two options here. One, it's correct, or one, or two, it's incorrect. If it's incorrect, you just go back and you read, you restate it five, six, seven, twenty times, as many as you need, and you write it down and then correct it again. If it's correct, you move on to the next phrase, and repeat that method again. Now you might think this is very time consuming, but it's better to get each phrase done correctly the first time around rather than wasting your time reading a textbook 
and not getting any valid work done. Okay, so you've gone phrase by phrase by phrase. The next thing I recommend is to memorize them in chunks of five. So after you five repeated or five learned, what you'll do then is you'll uh, restate all five, one after the other in your head and write down all five and then correct it. And when you're happy with you knowing the first five, then you'll do the next five. Then you'll put both fives together and get 10. And in some cases, you'll even go to 15. I'd be very reluctant to go to 15 in a single study session. Um, I'd be more likely to do five, maybe 10, and then do something else in my study because you want to be breaking up your study into different activities to keep you engaged throughout. Right, on to the next thing. Helpful resources, I've posted these on Edmodo. And these are basically flashcards whereby you can test yourself after you've learned them all solidly. Okay, the second language use issue that I found is the context within which you use the phrases. So let's take the following question. So if we look in the middle of the questionnaire, it says calculate the tension of the string and calculate the speed of sound in the string. Without any context, you could look at tension and say, okay, that tension could be related to the speed of a wave in an object, or it could be related to Newton's laws. F is equal to ma, and a force is an actual tension. So without a context, you really can't narrow down how to address that question. And how you, how you figure out which context by which to answer the question uh, is you look at the first sentence. And the first sentence says, resonance is a phenomena that is associated with musical instruments. So you now know you're dealing with sound, you're dealing with resonance, you may also need to answer questions based on resonance. You may have to use resonance in the correct context while you're answering questions. And if you look at the next bit, it says describe an experiment to demonstrate resonance. So it's reinforcing the context. And what that tell, then tells you about the calculations is the tension is actually a tension in a vibrating string or on a note. And the speed of sound in the string means you're probably going to use C is equal to F lambda. Okay, let's have a look at the marking scheme. And we'll see something interesting here. <clears throat> so I've broken the marking scheme for that particular question into two sections. And the reason I've done that is the one on the left is one context and the one on the right is a second context. And within questions, you may have multiple contexts. How you know that there's a second context coming into play is li it's likely that they'll ask you to define something different. And that is indeed what they do with sound intensity. They say define sound intensity and all of a sudden resonance is partially um, out the window. You're still in the area of waves but you're thinking about sound intensity now and the questions below that will be related to sound intensity more than they'll be related to resonance. And the last couple of years they've been doing more and more of this. So within a particular question there may be three different contexts that span an entire topic. So keep an eye out for it. Different contexts and you should be able to um, uh, go between the context now. All right, here's a strategy for you. So we've already dealt with learning phrases. You can go to the marking schemes and learn the phrases from the marking schemes if you wish, particularly if you don't know a phrase for a particular answer. And then what I'd suggest is coming back the next day and answering the exact same question that you did the day before, uh, just in your head, and making sure that you can answer all of those um, questions uh, very very quickly so it's more like a recap the day after you complete an exam question here's another method what you could do is you could uh, look at the exam question there and then go straight to the syllabus and we're looking specifically at the bottom half of it where it says define sound intensity so let's see in the syllabus sound intensity definition and units you should know sound intensity is power over area and then the next part what happens to the sound intensity and the sound intensity level when the distance is doubled and in the syllabus it tells you what happens now you have to use the formula there and the black text which says doubling the sound intensity increases the sound intensity level by three decibels to answer the question so you could attempt the question then and then go to the marking scheme and see have you correctly interpreted the syllabus um, via the uh, exam question okay the next one, understanding what a question is asking. So I just have these specific points. I'll go through it very quickly and you can read these in more depth later on. 
So to determine the context, you look at the top of the question, and a new context is typically introduced by a definition. What I'd also like you to remember is usually three marks is equivalent to one valid, valid scientific point that you may need to make in a test. So if there's 12, point, 12 marks going for a particular question, you need to answer four valid scientific points. If a question has a four mark going for it or five marks going for it, I would err on the side of caution and um, write down two points. So I'd round up rather than round down to the next three markers. Okay, and the final thing that I just want to say, it's a recap. <clears throat> when you're going through an exam question, I'd underline, tick, or make note of how many marks are going for each part of each question. Then I'd select which uh, of the questions I'm going to choose in each of those sections. And then once you've the question completed, I go back to the underlining the ticks or the notes that you've made for how much uh, you need to answer or what questions you need to answer, and I'd make sure I've answered all of it. And this is a typical mistake with students. Um, you might have draw a graph uh, to verify this law and make a valid conclusion from it. And people forget, the, forget to answer the second part. So this method will help you um, avoid losing unnecessary marks. Now, lads, I hope this is helpful.